Well, we're back here with Caspian. When we left off last, um, Caspian was talking about his abduction um, with the two ladies and um, as well as possibly meeting one of their um, children at some point in his life, which hasn't happened. And um, Caspian, if you'd like to continue on, go right ahead. Absolutely. Um, I think last time pretty much concludes uh, my family's experiences while we were still living in Church Me Close in Lavent. Um, it wasn't long after that um, that my mum, uh, she'd uh, married my stepfather um, at that point. He'd actually uh, grown up in Portsmouth and he himself had had quite a number of paranormal type experiences growing up, uh, particularly in the house that uh, he lived in, an old Portsmouth that he grew up in. Um, mostly like poltergeist and ghost related uh, things. Um, so he, he he kind of had an idea of the sort of things that we'd experienced. Uh, I hadn't discussed any of the um, abductions or anything like that with him. And honestly, at this point in my life, um, even though the, the abductions had only just finished, um, for, for some reason it was like my memories were just slowly starting to fade. Um, like I retained a lot of things and, you know, it all, it all came back to me later in my life and we'll, we'll get to that eventually. But, um, for, for a while it was just like, it sort of just faded into memory, into the background and then just kind of went all together. Um, and like, it helped. I suppose got replaced by other important things in life, but. And how um, old were you around, around this, at this point? Around 10 years old. Okay. Um, yeah, my my mum had uh, married my stepfather, and uh, we decided that we were going to move out of our our rental property in in Lavent, um, go five minutes drive down the road to Chichester, where I'd been born, um, and where mum's family lives, and we bought a house uh, on Bogner Road, and uh, so far as we were aware, we we knew that it was a a Victorian build, um, it had been around for quite some time, it had sort of been here and there renovated um but there was no real like uh activity that we could tell that anybody reports or anything like that so once again it was it was it seemed to be something that was you know beginning after we moved in but we hoped that you know when we moved from Lavent to Chichester all of that activity would stop like it would all just be left behind it would it would stick with our house but it didn't we we still had a lot of the same things we had um the same sort of mists in the house we had the same you know, typical sort of cold patches, um, electrical interferences. We had the orbs come back that I described last time. Had quite a number of, of instances of those. And a number of uh, other strange things as well, like um, my auntie, uh, she came around our house and would often say that she could smell uh, rotten eggs throughout most of the house, especially on the, the, the lower floor. None of the rest of us could smell it, but she was absolutely adamant that she could smell rotten eggs. But the first real... Uh, things of note for the curd in the house um was firstly oddly enough one day it was not long after we'd moved in i'd uh, i'd gone into one of our two bathrooms at the end of the house adjacent to the garden and uh as i turned the corner and came through the door i saw that there was the hindquarters of a pig <laughs> sticking literally sticking out through through the um through the wall and it wasn't like a, a pink pig it was like this this sort of wiry haired gray looking very stocky pig that was was halfway through the wall and i immediately called mum and i was uh, you know for, for mum to come and see and she could see it as well and as she came and and saw this pig it just walks forwards this hindquarters of a pig walks forwards through the wall as if it isn't there and me and mum rushed outside to to go and look in the garden to see if it was there and it totally disappeared it wasn't until like four years later but uh, we ended up doing research into the area and we learned that it had actually been once the size of a, a huge pig farm. And it had been that way since like the, uh, I think it was like the Saxon era. It had just been a continuous set of orchards and pig farms. Um, and we had no idea about that. There was also uh, another thing that happened in the house was this little uh, Victorian girl in a red dress that kept on appearing uh, to my little sister. Eventually, I actually saw her myself, and me and mum actually heard her at one point, but we initially thought that she was just an imaginary friend, in, in my little sister's case. But uh, my stepfather, he used to wake up at night, and um, it, it got to a point I, I started hearing this as well. It sounded like uh, my little sister was laughing in her bedroom with, with the sound of another older girl. 
and this could go on for quite a little while and then you know my stepfather would get up and he'd go into that room and of course he opens the door and there's just my little sister in there there's there's you know there's there's nobody else but there was adamant about what she looked like you know she would often come and talk to her um you know she'd jump on her bed she'd play with her toys and it got to the point that like this this girl was actually telling us you know uh telling the rather you know oh I'll, i'll do these things while you're out you know i'll move these things and when you come back um, you know, that'll be proof. And that's exactly what happened. So uh, slowly over time, we, we began to understand that she was um, she was an actual tangible phenomenon. She was uh, a real thing, so to speak, not just an imaginary friend. For me, though, the biggest uh, occurrence uh, while we were living there began in 2002. And it was about early to midway through the year. And I'd woken up. I can't remember exactly what time. I think it was around to something in the morning. Mum remembers it being a little bit earlier because she had sort of concurrent memories of, of the events that happened that night, slightly differing in a few in a few respects, but concurrent in others. Um, but for me, I, I thought I'd woken up about about two something in the morning. And I could see uh, again that sort of that dusky moonlight, those beams um, coming through my window blinds. And so I went over to my to my window, I got out of bed and went to look out my window. Um, you know, again, to see if the moon was there. Instead, the moment that I, I pulled up the blinds, I could see that there was just this massive, and I mean like massive triangular um, black vehicle just hovering right across in the back of our house above the allotments. And it was as I was looking at it, I can't, I don't know exactly how long I was stood at my window for looking at it, but as I was looking at it, I noticed that there was two other ones. There was one here, and then there was one further up here, and they were much smaller in the sky relative to this this larger one that I could see. And I opened up my bedroom window to see if I could hear anything. And I could hear this kind of very low kind of electrical hum, this kind of this kind of meow, meow, meow kind of sound. And I later said to mum, it was it was exactly like uh, when you're standing next to an active power substation and it's making that kind of electrical humming noise. Also as well, the uh, the, the trees that are adjacent to... Uh, the allotments, the ones that were away from the bottom of the craft weren't moving at all. And there was no real wind that night. But the the leaves of the trees that were just underneath one of the corners of this triangle were actually moving. They were swaying as if they were kind of being buffeted by this breeze. And as I, I stood there and I was just looking at this thing, and I, I think while I was looking at it, I was trying to count. There was like these three red lights on the underside. And in between each of the red lights, there was these rows I think like four or five uh, uh, across three rows of these rectangular white lights. And I was trying to count all of them as I was standing at my bedroom window. And as I was looking at it, this this set of like five, it was it was very much like the, the moonlight type beams, but red in color, this kind of like crimson red cluster of like five beams came down from the middle of it, down into the allotment. Um, and uh, in the bottom of the beams where they hit the ground, literally just materialized so out of thin air. It wasn't that I saw them coming down. It was just that they appeared. These these three figures that were standing in a triangular formation, you know, one in front and, and two on either side. And I couldn't make them out quite so well because they were, they were quite shadowed over in the allotments. But I could see that, you know, they, they, were, they looked armored and they were of a red sort of color. And as I was looking out at them, I noticed that the one that was standing in front of this triangular formation, he lifted up his head. He'd been looking, they'd all been looking at the ground. He lifted up his head and it was like he was looking directly at me. And then mm. all three of them turned literally in unison all together and walked in perfect step of each other, again, in total unison, uh, round towards the allotment gate. And I immediately rushed out of my room because I wanted to meet these pilots. I, I, wanted, I thought they were going to go down the road and I'd have to run to catch up with them. Um, so I was going downstairs, um, like as quickly, but as quietly as I could. And I mean, like everybody else was obviously asleep in the house. And when I got downstairs to, to the bottom, I noticed that around the front door and then the entrance hallway was the sort of, uh, the, the sort of paranormal thick mist that we often see. And I remember that I, I just, I went through that, went through the kitchen, went round out to the back door. Once again, interestingly, finding it unlocked, even though it was always something that, you know, we'd leave locked. And I went outside, you know, again, thinking I'm going to have to go out through a back garden, rush down the um, the street, the, the roads, Blackberry Lane. And um, the, the pilots were already in my back garden. Um, there was one of them who was standing on our garden path. Like as I, as I came out and I turned my head, 
literally one standing on the garden path dead ahead of me with this weird sort of the, the only thing I can describe it as is a gun. It was like a kind of gun that he was holding in his hands. He had it kind of uh, slung across himself. It wasn't a, a particularly large thing, and it was very unusual because it didn't have anything that a gun would normally have. Like, you couldn't see any kind of trigger. There was no way of seeming, you know, to load it, nothing like that. It was just a kind of smooth, strange object that he was holding in both of his hands. And I noticed that uh, there was there was one of these ones that was standing on the path dead ahead of me. There was another one further behind that was standing behind our garden wall at the bottom of the garden. And he was he was turned in such a way that he was kind of looking back and forth between our garden and where I was and then the allotments and then back again and just repeatedly doing this head movement back and forth. Um, he was also holding one of the weapons as well. And then a third one was standing. So again, they're in a kind of triangle formation. The third one again was standing uh, at the edge of our lawn next to where our, our garage was. And it was standing next to one of our flower beds that we had. And uh, it was holding a, a shovel like a sort of uh, a snow shovel in in one hand and in the other he had cradled this brown box which had all of these silver um symbols all over the top of it and they were obviously catching the lights being being cast in summer whether it was the the street lamp or something like that because they were glistening in this kind of chrome silver color and i could make out all of these different um shapes and symbols and things on the box and i i have i have no idea why i was just so bold in in approaching the, the pilot that was standing in front of me on on our garden path but i walked straight up to him and I said, hi, you know, who, who are you and why are you in our back garden? And it was interesting because uh, just like Astara had done before um, in, in those earlier abductions in Davant, these ones were obviously capable of speaking using their voice as well. And, and this one did. It sounded like he was talking through a gas mask. They were all wearing what looked like these kind of flight helmet gas masks with these bubble sort of eyes on them. This sort of padded, armored kind of suit. It was all a crimson red, like deep blood crimson red color everything was um including the, the the weapons that they were holding and uh so it sounded like he was speaking through this mask uh, a lot of a lot of what he was saying he was the one that communicated with me and a lot of what uh they were saying was just deflection he replied to me by asking um you know what my name was and just as i was about to reply and tell him my name he said oh it's caspian isn't it and I was like, oh, okay, so you you know who I am then. And I, it's it's like I could tell that I was standing. I think it just sort of occurred to me, but I could also tell like the sort of feeling that I was, you know, standing in front of people of military rank. And, you know, so having grown up in, in a family where, you know, my, my father and my, my grandfather and my great grandfather were all, uh, you know, military and RAF men, my, my grandfather quite accredited you know quite well known. My, my immediate reaction was just to like completely straighten up and be like, you know, yes, sir. Um, kind of thing and just be com completely obedient but at the same time like curiosity was was getting the better of me and everything he he said that the, the one that was standing beside him that was by our flower bed they wanted to bury the box that he was holding in my back garden and it was supposed to be to keep me and our neighborhood safe from some never defined threat for for, for no given reason and you know he asked you know is this okay you know basically do i have your permission to do it and i was like yeah go ahead so he this this other one he he takes his shovel and i've never seen anybody dig so slow like he was absolutely taking his time to dig this hole just as slowly as possible to, to put the box in and the weird thing was was that the hole never seemed big enough for the box but somehow it just went in completely but yeah so he was he was digging this hole he started digging this hole as soon as i'd said that and uh, i immediately asked more questions of this this pilot that was in front of me because I, I want to know what what this craft was because to be honest it felt menacing there there was something very very unsettling about it and it wasn't just kind of like the size of it or the imposingness of it or just how unusual it looked um and at this point i i honestly just thought it was an aircraft i thought it was an airplane i thought it was something that had come from like the the air strip at Tanglia or, or something so I, I was I was asking because you know of how sinister it felt and everything I was just asking so you know what what is this how how do you fly it how is it just hovering there is it like a helicopter um you know because I'd seen helicopters hovering before and his, his responses to me were basically uh, you know oh you, you know you shouldn't be worrying about this you shouldn't be thinking about this you know you shouldn't be asking these sort of questions don't think about that and he, he explained to me that what they were there for was just a routine visit 
but of course I'd never seen them there before and I never saw them since. So, you know, I was, I was asking all of these questions. I was constantly getting deflections about what I was asking. They just, they didn't seem to want to, to give any sort of reply. And I, I, I know I was out there for quite some time because again, this, this hole was being dug so slowly and I was getting freezing cold because, you know, I was barefoot. I was only in my pajamas, um, you know, short sleeves and everything. And so it got to a point where I asked the pilot who was standing in front of me, you know, can I, can I go indoors and get mum and tell her that you're out here, you know, now, now that you're, you're, padding down the soil on top of that box at long last, you know, can I, can I go in and get her? And he, he said, oh yes, that's, that's fine. You know, go in and fetch your mother. And so the moment that I, I turn around and I'm going to go back into the house to go get her, I feel his hand come down hard on my shoulder. And he's like, he's pushing me down. He's, he's putting pressure on me and pushing me down. Um, and he, he just sort of whispered next to me, they're here, duck, run. And I'm like, who's here? <laughs> I'm terrified. And I just ducked as low as I could and rushed towards the, um, towards the back door and into the kitchen. And again, because I, I was young and it just felt comforting to me, I immediately hid next to our fishbowl uh, as best as I could. But as I was rushing away towards the house, he lifted up this, this weapon that he'd been holding, again, which has no trigger whatsoever. And it was like it was firing without him having to move his hand. No, rec no recall that I could make out in like little turn back that I did or anything. He was firing with this kind of like uh, this whoosh -womp, whoosh -womp, whoosh -womp kind of sound. These long sort of metallic stakes towards the dining room window. And I, it, was, it was going past me. I was over here and these, these things were coming down over here. Um, but they weren't actually hitting the window. It's like they seem to be just sort of disappearing um, before before they actually hit it, just like into thin air as if there was just something there. And that was the last I saw before I rushed indoors. And once I hid down uh, beside the goldfish bowl, the next thing I knew I was waking up and it was 7.30 in the morning. It was my normal time. And I immediately went into mum and I, I said to her, you know, mum, you, you, you're not going to believe the, the, you know, what, what happened to me last night. You're not going to believe the, the sort of experience I had. It might be in a dream. I don't know, but you're not going to believe it. And mum turns to me and she says, you're not going to believe what happened to me last night and i was immediately intrigued so um i i i can't remember whether or not it was it was uh, me and mum that or mum that went first and telling the story um i think it was it, it might have been me but either way mum said to me that uh, she'd woken up um at what she thought was like one something in the morning and she'd heard this electrical buzzing sound in her bedroom so whereas i'd heard it outside where this this low triangle was she'd actually heard it in her room and she described it exactly the same way as i did and shortly after she'd woken up and heard this sound, I, or what looked like me, had been at her bedroom door and was saying to her, mum, you've got to come downstairs. You've got to see something out in the garden. I've got to show you something out in the garden. So mum got up and followed me downstairs. She also uh, verified, like I'd seen, that there was like this mist in front of the, uh, in front of the front door and in the entrance hallway. And just as she was going out to the kitchen, she felt like she had to turn back. She said she was never able to follow me outdoors into the back garden. She felt like she had to turn back. And as she did, she saw like this dark shape, like this massive, ugly expressioned face that was forming in front of the front door. And she said that it rushed at her at high speed. Like she could feel this like immense dripping, seething, like malevolence from it. And it rushed at her and smacked her hard in the center of the chest and literally lifted her off her feet and smacked her into the kitchen units. Like it really hurt her back. And she crumpled to the floor and effectively like blacked out and then woke up later in the morning. And that's what she remembers. So I told her what I'd experienced as a corroboration and we immediately went downstairs and went outside you know the back door was unlocked um you know we, we went outside in the garden and the interesting thing is is that there was actually a pile there was a mound clearly not a molehill there was like a little mound a, a padded down mound that was exactly where the box had been buried and we immediately went and got our, our trowels our garden trowels and dug into it to see if we could find this box but there was nothing there and we went uh to, to look at the dining room window as well to see if we could find any of these stakes embedded in the wall, but there was absolutely nothing there. And mum was convinced that uh, they'd been firing at whatever it was that attacked her. But there's a little bit of a discrepancy there because what I had seen was them firing towards the dining room window. And what mum had experienced was something rushing down the entrance hallway towards the kitchen, which is in a, a different part of the house. It was across from where they were shooting. That, that didn't fully add up. Um, but mum had a terrible pain in her back for, for a little while afterwards, as, you know, so she'd actually been thrown against the kitchen units. And I had this really weird, it was all on, on this side of my body. It started up here on my neck 
and went down like in a sort of a sort of open pad and down onto the top part of my arm. It was like this weird sort of rash that I had for like an entire week, this sort of reddening of the skin like I've been sunburned. That's um, where he that's where he grabbed you and, and or it is. That's, that's where a tank came down on my shoulder, yeah. But it, it didn't sting. There wasn't any heat coming off it. It never stinged or itched. We put loads of double base cream and everything on it. It did absolutely nothing. Um, and just after a week, it just went away of its own accord. So that was that was the uh, thing that you know followed after that for me. The uh, the, the following day, Mum had actually had uh, a conversation with my with my stepfather in the kitchen, and asked him if he'd been aware of anything that had happened that night. But apparently, he just slept through all all of the proceedings. He had absolutely no idea. And he was quite he was quite patronizing towards me about it. Uh, he was just treating it like me and Mum had just had a nightmare. Well, he was treating it like Mum had had a nightmare. Like he wasn't even acknowledging that. I'd experienced anything, but I think that the only acknowledgement he gave was that whatever I'd said to mum was because, you know, we'd watch Most Haunted or whatever. Um, and obviously, you know, I'd, I'd been psychologically triggered or something. Um, and he just, he went upstairs and that, that was the end of it. But um, he himself, after that incident, even though he hadn't actually been involved in it, he hadn't actually been awake, he started having this, this is the first time in his life, and he started having this really weird set of occurrences, as completely insane as it sounds, where he would be walking past street lamps under street lamps and they'd be progressively going off and he could literally stand and wait and it was only when he went under it it would just suddenly switch off and it wouldn't do it any other time if he went back it would switch on and he would come into like um our house uh, after coming uh, home from work late and whatever and all of the lights in the entire house would go out like total blackout the moment that he came in me and mum had this weird uh, thing happen as well where we could touch our television and turn it on and off by touching it, by touching the screen or touching the back of it, it would switch on and off. Yeah. Um, we would just be getting continuous electric shocks for like a couple of weeks. Um, like every single time we, we hugged each other or we touched something, even like a plastic bag, and we'd be getting like these electric shocks from it. I'm sorry, was that specifically after this event? Or... It was specifically after this event, yeah. Okay, wow. Um, it, it didn't last for too long, but it was quite intense while it lasted. It's so, it's, it, yeah. it's so interesting to hear all that because it's like uh, the, the person digging the the hole to to, to bury the box it's it's almost like it's it's weird that it has both that you found a physical remain you found the mound yeah. there was no box in it so that no feels like it's almost yeah. an, an interdimensional style thing because you're not really sure whether these things like your mom said it was a dream so she wasn't really sure that it really happened because after she got hit and she, her she hurt her back from the impact she found herself waking up but she still yeah, has a score back, um, and it, it's it's really amazing the the idea of the interdimensional aspect of you know mm -hmm. consciousness and and were you actually conscious when this happened or were you, was it a second you or it brings me almost makes me think uh, that when your mom saw you was that your doppelganger or was it was it you but you were just in a a different place at the same time almost doing the quantum physics yeah, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, thing yeah, yeah. it's it's, yeah, it's it, fascinating. It, it, there's definitely a few questions I have. Um, I'm just looking at the report here and I see that you drew like the shovel in the, um, the box and it looks like there's some symbols on the box there. Could you describe those a little more like what you saw if there was anything um, familiar? Circles, lines and triangles. A lot of it was very similar to what I'd seen on the ships back in Levant. Okay. Um, the most prominent symbol that was on it was this sort of triangle on the right side of the box. It was, it was sort of like a, a, a partial triangle um, and the rest of it was all just these overlapping circles and these these lines and things. Um, the closest that I can compare it to probably is uh, ancient Hebrew um, in, in the way that Hebrew mm. is, is written, something like that. But yeah, that's that's what the that's what the symbols look like. And they had this kind of like, as I say, this kind of reflective chromic look to them. The box so itself just looked like plain wood. Yeah, I've heard um, before that those really ancient languages, especially ancient he Hebrew, um, if you actually take the characters and do a three-dimensional shape based on the two-dimensional characters, it actually can produce some very interesting shapes. And the speculation is that it may have um, influence to physics in certain geometries um, mm -hmm. and quantum physics and magnetism, things like that. I have heard that before. An additional question for these, um, pretty much these military men, you said almost like a crimson, looking at the picture here, um, just like this crimson shoot. Was there any like oxygen or type of like tanks that were attached to them? Or is no, it no tanks, no, no tanks, tanks whatsoever. They, they had this, um, they had this kind of, 
I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not sure what you call it at the front of a um a gas mask like this mm -hmm. this tube like on a vacuum cleaner they they mm -hmm. had that and it was kind of across here came down the front and came into uh, sorry wrong side it'd be it'd be this shoulder if it's mirrored on the screen yeah but they they came down into that shoulder and that is the only indication of any kind of breathing apparatus there was no tanks that i could see nothing like that no so um, no you weren't able to see any facial features or anything like that no, nothing nothing so like that you, do you assume it, that they were humans or do you think maybe yeah based based on their voice which sounded like it, honestly it sounded like somebody from the local area it just sounded like a mm. a, a, a guy in like a 30s or 40s it, so it sounded human they they were about human height um between five and six feet they were you know had a human appearance to them it was just that they were fully armored in this weird outfit um, any accent and of course, when you talk a, yeah just just a, a general southeast coast um accent like one one year in trisha it was just a, a local mm. accent um mm. nothing out of the ordinary about it at all and that's why i thought they probably come from nearby tangmere um or something like that because you know my great grandfather before he'd been stationed out in egypt he'd been at the tangmere airstrip so i knew about that through him and i i didn't realize at the time it hadn't actually been operational uh since the 1970s was when it stopped being operational but i thought it was still open so i thought that these craft had come from there these airplanes uh so i thought of them but yeah and really the the last question i have really do you think perhaps that maybe you pretty much you know he asked you your name it seems that you mm -hmm. kind of thought your name first and then he said oh you're caspian as if maybe Possibly. there's some type of telepathy he's picking it up or he knew who you were um yeah. so i guess it's either Could almost like one, yeah it's either one of those two things and both cases are <laughs> interesting whatever dimension you want to look at it but that's um yeah very just also unsettling in both instances but yeah yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it's just it's just like whoa that that whole experience is whoa and um it's yeah. interesting we, yeah yeah it's go ahead adam if you wanted to yeah it's just it. interesting there's like the correlation between your mother and you but there's like one separate part that's not necessarily correlated which three you know, three separate parts okay, i okay. um i heard the the noise coming from the craft outside she heard it in her room I do not remember ever going up to her room and inviting her out into the garden. Okay. Uh, she remembers seeing me coming to her room and inviting her out to the garden. And she got attacked in the hallway in the, the kitchen area. I saw them shooting towards the dining room. So that's three mm -hmm. long corroborating details okay. between us. Yeah. Interesting. And just one last thing, and then um, uh, go ahead, Leaf. Yeah. The same humming that you heard, I know an experience from an area where I grew up, like in the Bridgewater Triangle, where there also was a triangular sighting by two police officers. And they really? Described, yes, they described the same exact sound, that like low, that very weird, like humming sound. And my impression yeah. that something was going wrong with the craft because it was actually very low. I think the one that you uh, you described was a lot bigger, but I'm not sure I'd have to go back and... Um, listen to the case. It, it was it was about two thirds the length of the football pitch. That's that's. It, it, yeah, actually, it may have been. Yeah, yeah, it may have been a similar size. Actually, now that I think about it, but the same exact sound it was like that odd, just this very weird electric hum. Yeah. Um, very very strange. Yeah. Well, I, now I have two questions because when you described uh, first seeing this large triangle, and there were the other two, um, it sounds like it, it's like up on on its side like how did how did it look you said it was it was, was um, it like it's it's, dif it's difficult to describe um so like, yeah the ones the ones that are higher up from what i could see they're tipped at like this sort of angle um the two ones that are the highest up um and then the one that's lower to the ground is kind of it's it's above the trees but it's ever so slightly like ever so slightly tipping up leaning up on one side but it's not it's not like very pronounced it's just it's yeah. a little a little tip the, the other ones were, were definitely on a sort of like a slope a slant what whatever you'd call that yeah yeah um higher up in the sky yeah yeah nonetheless it's it's still just that's so fascinating you heard it you went down you've you talked to them they sounded like normal people and normal people well, you, yeah you, yeah. you yeah. had that experience and uh, it's it's fascinating but oh yeah and you know what i was also looking at for it as well um, this is also um, the, the orbs followed you guys too, because you had orbs at the prior place in Levant, yeah, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and so there was um, orbs and a pendulum. So I don't know if that was before or after this event. Oh, the the pendulum uh, was before actually. Um, we'd we'd invited our our priest, um, our parish priest from Lavant, 
uh, round to our house to bless our house with holy water because we didn't know what this what this uh, imaginary friend Emily was. Mm-hmm. Um, it had no effect, obviously. You know, Emily was still there for like years and years and years of my little sister's life. Um, but uh, mum had actually been given this uh, crystal dowsing pendulum, like the teardrop shape at the bottom, uh, by our family friend, uh, Brian. He was, he was a, um indigenous American shaman, friend, a friend of my dad's, my, my birth dad, um, not my stepfather. And uh, yeah, he'd, he'd given mum this, this crystal, uh, crystal pendulum. And it was the first time that we'd really bought it out. Um, like we we tried a couple of times before and it hadn't really done anything. Like we 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 weren't sure if it was you know if it was able to work. But he'd said that you know uh, you've got to ask it yes or no questions. It's got to swing one way for yes, the other way for no. In this particular instance, we'd actually been asking about Emily, about this this Victorian girl. And as as mum was was holding it, you have to do it as gently as you can. The whole idea is you're not supposed to be affecting yourself. So she was holding it as gently as she could. And the thing was just, it started going like in this massive, great big circle, round and round, round, like faster and faster and faster, and just flew out of her hand across the room and and hit the opposite wall. Um, And we were like, okay, we're we're not asking anything more. Um, Like, okay, we we, we, we get it, we get it. And we we actually didn't. We, We put it away for years after that and didn't use it. It's always interesting to hear people that have been had the uh, abduction experience or any kind of UFO experience that is kind of like more than just seeing something that their parents are usually in the military. And at mm-hmm. at any time, like, I, I don't know if you uh, talk to your grandfather, or your, you said your father as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, if they yeah. if if they were any in any kind of top secret no. stuff that they said, oh, you know, no, it was just standard. No, no. Military uh, completely okay. stands, and the interesting thing is, is that that side of my family, my father's side of the family, had no reports of paranormal UFO experiences at okay. all. Um, yeah. Whereas it was my mum's side of the family that I can trace it back on a number of okay. generations. Um, right. So yeah, you can write that off then. <laughs> but um, also, there were um, after I don't know if it was after the pendulum incident, but um, you had the strange entities in the living room and oh no this this was after the triangles yeah um yeah this this was a couple of weeks after the triangles mm-hmm. um it was interesting actually it was just after the uh, electrical effects of all of us had calmed down and me and mum had uh instantly despite my my stepfather's patronization we'd um we'd actually been sitting because we, we had a tv in the living room and another one in the dining room and we we'd been sitting in the living room uh, and watching um most haunted and uh as we were coming towards the end of the program you know, we, we, we felt like the, the temperature in the room was, was dipping. We could see the mist. And me and mum were, you know, we, we were thinking, oh, maybe it's just a response to watching the program. You know, don't pay much attention to it. And then all of the power in the entire house went out. I don't think my stepfather was home at this point. I think if he if he was, he, he wasn't around. But, yeah, all, all of the power just in the entire house completely went out. Uh, TV went off and just completely plunged us into darkness. And me and mum were, were just looking at each other on the sofa like, oh, you, you know, what happened? And she was about to get up because she was going to fiddle with stuff at the wall. When we noticed that it was like, it, it kind of like came like this kind of thing. It was like that sort of um, appearance. There was these two red orbs, not quite as dark blood like crimson as the, the pilots have been, but more of a like brighter red color. Um, they they appeared it, hovering um in in the middle of the living room between us and the television for mum that's all that she could see she could see these two um red orbs uh whereas for me as i was looking at them it's like this this form was forming around each of them kind of like a a, a shadowy sort of human type shape but it didn't have any arms or legs as it was going down in its torso towards the ground and it was intersecting with all of this mist that we could see this low-lying mist it was like the mist itself was curling up uh, the only thing that I can compare it to, which I, I said to Ian and I, I said to mum at the time, was it looked at like in the way that, you know how steam kind of curls up a bit from a kettle? It looks exactly like that. It was like this kind of steam was kind of curling up and making like these these tendrils, like these tentacles almost of mist um, mm-hmm. that were coming from the bottom of it, but were also like part mixed with a shadow of what they were. Um, and for me at the top of their heads, the, the red orbs, which would be where their faces have been, had become like these red torch lights. Um, again, it's completely insane as this sounds, that were shining up out of their heads and were making like a, a pair of circular patterns, red circular patterns on the roof, on, on the and ceiling. You, and um, yeah. you saw this and your mom didn't. She just My saw mom orbs. did not see that. She just saw orbs, yep, and I could see it's the two Yeah. 
so anyway, once um once we'd seen them uh, materialize, me the interesting thing is is me and Mum could both hear them, but Mum could hear them in this very muffled kind of way. It was kind of like, kind of way. But every single time, because during the course of this, like um sort of, I can't tell if it was telepathic or part audible. It was strange. But during the course of this this conversation that they were having with us, occasionally they would like get really loud something that they would say like a sudden like bark kind of thing and mum was just literally jumping out of her skin like she she was immediately reacting to it so it was obvious that she was able to hear it as well but to me they they were they initially started talking about how they they come into our living room uh, allegedly through some kind of portal <laughs> that was uh, it was apparently invisible to our senses we couldn't see it with our eyes we couldn't smell it we couldn't touch it whatever only they could see it and allegedly some portal had opened up in our living room and it had just so happened that from God knows where they'd been using crystals to open portals and had come to our living room of all places. Um, and now, now that, you know, they were here and I was immediately like, what are you on about? Like, like crystals, portal, like, what are you talking about? You know, like my, my brain was going, this is nonsense. I, I, it was, it was weird because even at the time I was having this feeling like, this just sounds like rubbish. This is tosh. Like, what are they on about? Um, like, I, I could feel like it was all just uh, you know, nonsense. And um, But every single time I was trying to ask them questions, as they were saying things to me, it's like they would go, no, like really suddenly. Um, and that was what was most mostly what was causing mum to, to jump out of her skin. I mean, it got to a point, I can't remember what, what most of the conversation ends up being. It was a really bizarre conversation, like <laughs> really, really bizarre. And it got to, to the end of it. And they just both seemed to mellow out. And it was interesting because because uh, when when they talked, it was one of them would talk, the other one would continue, then the other one could, would continue, and the other one would continue. It was like they were sharing the same mind and just talking together. And just as we were getting to the end of this conversation, uh, the one that's that's on this side says to me that they they want me to uh, as a sort of parting gift, they want me to go get a parchment, and the other one says that they want me to go get a writing device, you know, uh, and they they wanted me to go get that, and that they were going to. Um, like give me give me things i had to see like this alphabet of symbols and i had to write it down i had to memorize it and then dispose of the parchment hmm. so which is is highly convenient because then you don't have the parchment to, to show anybody so anyway i um we, we we reasoned that what they meant by parchment was a piece of paper so we went and got a piece of lined paper and we thought that what they meant by a writing device was probably like a pen or a pencil um, so we went and got one of those and the way that they were doing it, it's like they're, they're impressing this kind of like fit pressure going up like this into, into my forehead of like all of these symbols. And it was all just a bunch of like triangles of like circles all around it and all of these like line bits and all this sort of thing, all, all of it just these sort of symbols. And I had to have my eyes closed because I was focusing on it so much. So as a result, it was going everywhere. Like I was I was trying to 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 write and draw all this stuff as it was all coming in. And the way it was coming in, it was like flash, 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 flash. And I was trying my best to like to do all of these things as best as I could. They seemed to be completely satisfied by the total and utter mess that it ended up being. Um when when I when I'd finally opened my eyes and looked at it. And the last thing that they they said to us was that, oh, you know, you've got to remember, you've got to go um you've got to go destroy it now. You've got to get rid of it. So me and Mum went out to the kitchen sink and took a match to it um in the empty kitchen sink and burned it. And then when we came back into the living room, the, the orbs were gone, the beings were gone. The, the mist was still lingering a little bit, but it wasn't as strong. But the, the power was still completely out in the house until the following morning or so. It was either the following morning or halfway through the following day. Um, like the power was out for, we couldn't switch anything back on the entire house. But yeah, so they, they'd just gone. So yeah, fire, fire away if you've got any questions about that. But yeah. The whole, the whole thing was just bizarre. Yeah, I have uh, quite, just quite uh, so bizarre. And I'm looking actually at the symbols here. And where they do, I do see a lot of the triangles and a lot of the circles. Where Was it anywhere similar to the symbols on the box that was, you know, buried? Yeah, a few, preview, it preview. was. Very yeah. interesting. Um, and I do just have a general comment here where I was actually very fortunate enough to talk to a um, parapsychologist during my graduate degree. I probably talked to him for about three hours and um, finding parapsychologists are very, very rare. I think there's only, this is a rough estimate, 300 yeah. to 500 in, a, in the, on the planet right now with actual wow. training. Yes, I believe it's that low. It might be higher, but it's very, it's, <laughs> it's let's just say it's not a, a traditional academic route. 
Yeah. But what he described, he did work uh, with poltergeists out in Europe, I think in the 80s or so, or even late 70s. And what his main ideology was, is like, you're not, these um, situations don't just happen in random environments. It's more so the people almost like attract this phenomena. They attract this phenomenon um and it's almost like a magnet and he realized that it's not like i said not the you know location or the house or the building it's more so who who's living in there and he came to this conclusion again based on like research of all these um interactions with poltergeist and he said hey he started correlating wow it seems to be kind of following these people uh, these, these families and things like that it actually move and then all of a sudden, there's a phenomenon in a totally different environment. I felt that's very, um, you know, that's, that that's made, just like what it was for us. Yes, yeah. I, I definitely see that same um, that same philosophy, you know, and uh, especially with your family, um, and on your mother's side as well. But um, yes, yeah, very interesting conversation. And if you have a chance to talk to parapsychologists, please do because they always have. I will do. Yeah, um, yeah, they always have very interesting things uh, to say, and um, a big part of it too. You talked about uh, shamanism as well. And again, really not um, culturally kind of a woo-woo type of thing, but the principle behind it is um, very true. And I believe there are a lot of shamans here, but they're not trained like a traditional shaman would be like in the past. Um, but, yeah, yeah to, my, to my awareness, Brian had been, he, um, he said that he'd been, uh, what, what I remember him saying was that he had been chosen by the spirits like when he was a very early teenager or a young boy um and they'd had all of these these visionary experiences involving the spirits where they'd like um you know prepared him for, for the task and everything in some way um and all of this and like all of the the kind of stuff that he'd been through but yeah to, to my awareness he was um yeah he was he was a, a properly called shaman um but yeah yeah it's not a not an easy life especially in the culture we have now because um yeah, <laughs> you're gonna go against yeah. a lot of a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble. Um, but yeah, the, it, it, that's essentially right. Um, you know, it's like a, this very um, this like calling from you know from nature beyond nature, whatever you want to call it. But um, mm. it's just very interesting. Yeah, yeah, and, and the other interesting aspect is is you could say it's that nature aspect is we're all different, and for some reason yeah. Yeah. you were able to see so much more than your mom. And, and again, yeah. you've, you've also had these um, paranormal, paranormal and uh, phenomenon experiences happening to you throughout your life. Um, and it's, it's a genetic thing. I don't know. One thing Adam always says, what's your blood type? Because <laughs> sometimes... Um, o, o negative for me. Um, oh, okay. which is the same as my dad i believe yeah oh negative okay yeah and, and I, I do believe um genetics and biology is very very important blood type is a very um, uh, one dimension but i think it even goes down to um the dna level things that we really yeah. there's a lot of things we assume i think the species assumes about dna and all that um process and i'd always direct individuals to orc or or theory of consciousness mm -hmm. i think that's a great start Again, heavily controversial in the quantum um, quantum physics community, but I believe that's a much better foundation than just the emergent quality of consciousness, which I think is total hogwash and quite uh, in the wrong direction. But uh, that's my own opinion. But other people agree. <laughs> Not that many, but other people do agree. Your next um, incident was another ufo incident or maybe it was the, the triangle incident and of course you had the anxiety attack at the uh, naval museum but maybe yeah. we'll say that for uh for the next time well, this, this is actually uh, pretty short so it's, it's mm -hmm. probably a good one to end on um because i don't remember much of it um it wasn't it wasn't long after i'd had this um you know the, the appearance of these these two things in our living room honestly there's there's not much of it i can remember i remember that i'd, I'd been woken up at some point in the morning i have this I have a vague memory of someone or some ones at my bedroom door, at my open bedroom door, but it's it it's very very faded. I know that at some point I was above our house, that I was I was up in the air. I could see our house. What whatever I was in, whatever I was floating in was um was transparent, or it's like you could see outside on the inside. And I remember that I was sitting on something that felt almost like a cast iron park bench. Um, you, you know, that kind of, that, that, that ridged, um, got gaps in it kind of feeling. 
I, I remember that at, at one point it's like we just took off at incredible speed. We we started passing over Chichester. I could see all of Chichester b- beneath us. We, we went a little bit higher. I could see all of Chichester. We were going out. I remember towards Bognor Regis. We were going out towards the coastline. And it did not take us that long to get there. And this is where my clearest memories of this really begin. I remember that we were going out over the the little uh, the the beach line, the the sand line. The water was was oh, it wasn't it wasn't as far in as I thought it would be actually. But I remember it was it was in. And we were going out over the water. And I remember that the the moon was was quite low, and that the moon was kind of reflecting um, across on the water. And as we were going out over it, there was like this horrible, kind of like dark shape um, that that was sat on top of the on top of the water. And there was like uh, you you could see like the the sea wasn't wasn't that rough from what I could see, but you could see it like it was. It was going around it, but there was like no ripples coming out from this thing, nothing like that. It wasn't the waves weren't crashing against it, but it was just kind of sat there at the surface, partially emerged. And there was like this opening in the top of it, like this sort of hole. I remember that we we went directly over the top of it and then horizontally straight down through whatever this this opening was at the top. I don't remember anything after that point. It's I just know we went down to I think darkness and then the next thing I remember was that I was underwater. I was actually in the waters of the English Channel. And I remember that I was just abjectly terrified. I remember that I had I had my eyes open and I could see that like there were the the thing that I I've been in was absolutely massive. Like this absolutely ginormous thing just sat in the water and it's horrible like thick powerful white spotlight was like coming out of the front of it going past me it didn't seem to be emitted from any kind of lens just a beam coming from the front of the object like static and not right in some way not a normal light at all it was like it was alive yet vile and illuminating the water and it was just silty and thick and brown and i was absolutely terrified because i didn't know how i wasn't drowning like I was, I was under the water, and I said, like, "Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! I should be dead!" Like kind of thing. And I, I that's the last thing I remember with with respect to that, and just how horrible, horrible that like dark black thing looked. And the next thing I remember was that I was above my my house, um, in, in whatever this thing was, this transparent thing, and we were going back down. It was like the roof was was approaching like this, and we were going down towards it. And the next thing that I remember after that is is waking up in in my bedroom but the thing is is when i when i remember what was standing at my door i couldn't tell you for certain if it had anything to do with that experience or if that had been a memory of when i'd been tucked in that night or something and it's just very faded and very fragmented i couldn't tell you so i can't say for sure if i can remember anything to do with any kind of beings or any humans or anything like that um i i have no idea i just um yeah, I just I, I remember the the experience my, myself and just how abjectly terrified I was of it. Well, yeah. I was going to ask. So, what's fascinating is the first thing you say is about um, when you uh, go over the water and what you see is is there is a horrible shape on on uh, the water and and mm-hmm. instantly it's obvious that you're not very happy to number one being taken somewhere and, and That's number what two. Shape. It was the shape of a pe- like a long rectangle, that, or, yeah, that, that sort of shape with a round bit at the top. Yeah. Huh. So it's as you've said Opening. before, it's kind of like a submarine, a long, su- just a long, pen-shaped yeah. type of submarine. It's interesting that you said it was horrible because there's some there's some memories that are probably st- stuffed away or wiped that you probably don't want to remember. Because obviously this was a really bad experience. Because my, I, yeah, go ahead. My, my case investigator, he wants to um, he, he wants to do a hypnotic regression um at some point that they they want to arrange to try and recover uh memories from from this incident in particular to sort of fill in the gaps. Let's try you and don't, remember more of it. Oh, okay. I was gonna yeah. say because you, you don't seem. I don't know that you you seem like you want to do that. It looks it's because it was it sounds like it was just terrifying for you. Something something yeah. bad happened there. I mean, f- 
for you to just be describing a shape as being horrible and terrible, um, something bad happened to you um, in this instance. And, and, and it's, it's a little scary just thinking about it. Uh, yeah, I've heard before a lot of the reason why um, most uh, experiences or uh, contactees or abductees don't remember is because they are highly, highly traumatic. And um, I do believe that there's probably a lot of people who have experiences and remember what they remember for whatever reason, the resilience, something wrong happened. I more so uh, lean towards the resilience of the individual um, mm -hmm. and they aren't able to participate in the, like human, common human culture be due to this, um, a lot of the stigma and things like that and the trauma of these experiences. And even yeah. if you don't remember them specifically, the body in some way or form does have that memory, you know, and, and again, it depends on um, what you view as memory and like what, how, um, how far you want to take memory. I've seen um, very abstract theories of memory where it's actually coded in physics. So what does that mean for your experiences if it's actually coded in the baseline um, in physics kind of gets very bizarre, but, um, does that yeah. kind of get to an, an Akashic memory of, of yes, everything? exactly. Yes. That could be like the Akashic records or even Carl Jung talks about like the collective unconscious it's things of like that or ancestral man memory. And we do know this to an extent with like epigenetics and things, but I, I do agree with leaf where, you know, it's up to you about things like that because, you know, some of these things may, you, you know, it may not be a good idea to bring up because it's, you know, it's like a whole new level of processing where really you already kind of went through what you remember, you know, and you're here now. But, you know, it's up to you if you want to go back again and, you know, potentially bring that back up in, in the regression and then, you know, have to kind of deal with those memories and then just the baseline. If it's like, whoa, just like that bad feeling that it's, you know, my you could really kind of go along that script and say, hey, maybe there's things that are worse. And this is just, you know, the beginning of what I remembered. But um, it's, it's always up to you. It's always up to, you know, things. Like how, that. how do you feel about it? Hmm. Um, I've, I've been I've been very, very 50 50 on it for a long time, because there's half of it is is definitely fear. Um, and sort of the the fact that there is a certain degree to which ignorance is bliss. Um, but in the end, I'm, I'm always going to have the, the memories I remember anyway. Um, there's a certain kind of uncomfortableness about not being able to remember. Um, and also the reason why I went into telling Ian, telling Bufog about any of this in the first place was not... I, I didn't actually want it publicized at first. I didn't want a report made of it or, um, or anything like that. I didn't want... Um, uh, you know, for, for any kind of um, interviews or podcasts or anything like that or, or any books or anything. And I, I still really don't I want any books or anything. I, I just wanted to report what me and my family had experienced just to have it on file, to have it on record as like part of a great body of knowledge and understanding so that, you know, in case anything could be gleaned. I just wanted it to benefit scientific understanding in some way. So for me, that's that's basically my my primary reason for in, in the end, agreeing with this more so than not is because I, I feel like it could contribute. It could it could be useful. There could be something I remember that could be useful. There may be nothing that I remember that's useful at all. Um, but what if there is? Um, so in my eyes, it's probably better to be brave and to and to try and face that. And then at least I, I know, even, even if it terrifies me, at least then I have an answer as to why I have the phobia that I do. You know, which which of course we'll get into next time. You know, but it, it it got to a point where it's like I I'd gone round my my auntie's house and I can't even look at my my little cousin's bathtub toy submarine without feeling terror, abject abject primal animalistic terror. Like I just want to claw my own skin off and just scream and scream and scream. And I need to know why that is. I, I need to know why it is that I just can't look at that. You know, without feeling that way. So. So in the end, I, I think it's probably better to, to be brave and to face that than not, you know, and to, to never know, because I'll just spend the whole rest of my life wondering. Yeah, so, I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of on your side because it's one of those face your fears thing, see what it was. And then once you find out what it was, 
um, you can work work through that and and uh, and I'm sure there are, and I'm sure there are groups out there. I've I've heard of plenty of them. Yes, to to face your fear and, and find out what it is. Um, that because I, I just can't imagine having to go through life just being uh, just having you know like you say you walk into your your uh, nephew's bathroom and there's a submarine there and suddenly you're just overcome with complete terror that. Uh, it's, it's extremely hard to be normal under those circumstances. Like yeah, I bet. Then, but, I'm sure, yeah, nothing's sure happened. Yeah, yeah, you just have to walk out and go. I'm gonna go. I'll be. I'll be over here and just walk out of the living room. Yeah, and just just go take my inhalers and then yeah, in another room and then act like I'm normal. Towards, yeah, yeah. Towards yeah. healing, the what you just described, I I do believe. Uh, you know, I'll say it again. There, everybody's different. Everybody has the choice to what they want to do. If they do have some of these experiences that are clearly suppressed. Um, but I do believe what you said is definitely the best route. It's better to know the truth and to deal with it and heal from it. I mean, it be, it's going to be work. I think, you know, a lot of this uh, healing does take work, especially psychological healing. But it's better to know uh, than to, to not know. And it took me, it took myself years to kind of come to that conclusion. Um, but yeah, ignorance is bliss, but it's the illusion of bliss. Yeah. yeah, I've I've just remember one last thing that I'll add before I'm um, for the interviews over as well to do about experience. One really weird association I have of it is that for some reason I remember it every single time I hear um Elson John's Rocket Man for some mm. reason. And I don't know why that one song triggers it. But I, I always remember the the events whenever I hear that song. So yeah, there's there's another completely uh, bizarre thing about yeah. it. But yeah. Wow. It's fascinating. Well, thank you again for uh, for being on with us. Um, yes, thank you. Thank when you. We, yeah, when we come back, you'll continue from here on yes. with with the uh, Naval Museum incident. So, uh, thank you so much, Caspian. Yeah.